Blog Talk Radio. And good evening, everybody, and thank you for tuning in to King Jordan Radio for Memorial Day weekend, May 23rd, 2013. And ladies and gentlemen, today we will be joined by uh, a body language expert in uh, Susan Constantine, and she will dispute the claims made uh, recently by Wade Robson. But she will also tell you uh, why there are some inconsistencies and uh, all kinds of interesting stuff you, you will learn from Susan Constantine. And she has a great background. Um, she also has a website, um, all kinds of, of good stuff. But before we get to her, I want to remind you folks to uh, friend me on Facebook at King Jordan Radio and uh, on Twitter at King Jordan, and uh, we'll keep up with you. I want to thank Mark. Arglarsh, uh for the interview that he gave me yesterday here. Um, Friday, tomorrow, I have Andrew Bogus from uh, Bogus from um, CBS.com, where we'll be talking hockey and uh, basketball and all kinds of fun stuff. And uh, that will be uh, to Friday. And Saturday, ladies and gentlemen, we will have the uh, tribute, if you will, to Owen James Hart. That's right, a two-hour spectacular, ladies and gentlemen, where you will see, oh, we'll talk, we'll have the audio of all the great moments from Owen Hart. And uh, the number to hang here, if you have any questions for Susan, will be coming on at 7.05. Uh, feel free, the number to call is three four seven eight five seven twenty nine fifty, and uh, we will touch on Jerry Sandusky, uh, and you'll see what a true pedophile is, uh, as Susan Constant, uh, Constantine um, will uh, will uh, walk us through that, and. Uh, I want to thank everybody also with the Tom Mesero. Um, interview. It was great. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. I got a very big reaction. Uh, I want to also thank Luna for putting it on YouTube. So if you want, you can listen to it on YouTube. Uh, the two videos I did with Thomas Mesero. Uh, I had Richard Herman earlier in the week. Um, very big week. So, uh, as we await Susan, uh, we're going to start with the uh, 2009 uh, incident with uh, Michael as soon as, uh, of course, uh, uh, Mrs. Constantine uh, calls in. So uh, that's the story. And let me bring you up to date. Of course, uh, Wade Robson, 30 years old now. Um, Okay, I think we have her here. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, from CNN and HLN Fox, you name it, she's one of the best. Susan Constantine, body language expert, joins us on King Jordan Radio. Susan, good evening. How are you? I'm doing great. And you? I'm doing good. I'm doing good. Uh, before we get anywhere, let's tell everybody about yourself. Um, the body language stuff, uh, when you started, and uh, the whole shebang, if you will. <laughs> the whole shebang. Okay. All right. Well, they call me the body language expert. I was given that name by the media. Uh, my background is I have a, a, a bachelor's degree in communications and a master's degree in psychology. And, and I have uh, four certifications in investigations and interrogations and a core trainer for a company called the Institute of Analytic Interviewing. And uh, basically what that all is is that you learn how to read 
facial expressions and body language, content analysis, statement analysis, voice analysis, and you tie it all together in one big package. And that's how you can really learn to read people. Um, right. So with that being said, I'm a teen court judge, a Supreme Court County mediator, a jury consultant, and I cover every high-profile trial that there really is in the U.S. And uh, you've covered uh, Casey Anthony, right? Right. Casey Anthony, um, right now the Jody Arias case. I'll be covering the George Zimmerman trial that's coming up. Uh, you name it. Uh, you know, it goes all the way back to Jordan Vandersloot. I mean, I could name even the Michael Jackson case that we've had some time ago. Uh, the mm -hmm. Red Murray. Yeah, so the, pretty much every case that we're in, if they're in trial, I get a phone call and I'm analyzing their body language, you know, if they're telling the truth or not, or what are they really thinking and <laughs> what the heck's up with them. Now, uh, on your website, first of all, let's tell everybody about your website and uh, uh, about your programs on your website. Sure. Well, if there's anyone out there that really wants to learn how to read body language, uh, my courses are certified actually in 15 different states, and they're certified for judges, mediators, attorneys, etc. But you know, wow. lay people and salespeople, they all want the program. But it's all—it's a program that you can find on my website. It's called Evaluating Truthfulness. It's a five-hour training course where you learn everything in a box, everything that I've learned over the last 12 years contained in one training program. So you can, you know, go through that, you know, study it and become a pro. In addition to that, there's a book that's on there just came out on April the 2nd. It's called The Complete Idiot's Guide to Reading Body Language. Um, you could purchase that book. You can also find it on Amazon. You can find it in, on Kindle as well. So there's all kinds of goodies on there, including a bunch of videos. If you guys are really into watching a lot of the court trials, you can go right on the media tab on the front page, click on to it, find whatever trial you're interested in, and you'll find me analyzing analyzing some, including the entire presidential debates, which I also covered for wow. Japan News. Yes. Wow. That's some resume. Uh, but with that in mind, um, obviously you've heard of the uh, – the uh, young man named Wade Robson, 30 years old, uh, something 20 years ago, now claiming uh, MJ inappropriately touched him. Uh, we've had the uh, uh, pleasure of having YouTube in this era, <laughs> so uh, <laughs> we get to hear uh, Mr. Robson, um, what he says in 2009. So what I'd like yeah. to do first uh, is play uh, Wade in 2009, and then I want you to give an analogy of that, okay? Okay, sounds great. Super. Hey, E.T., I'm Wade Robson. You're getting a sneak preview of our West Side Story-inspired VMA promo spots. So that's the great opportunity about MTV is the audience. Um, and obviously, there's so many connections with West Side Story and with Michael Jackson. I mean, Michael Jackson, one of his biggest inspirations was West Side Story. Um, if you look at the Beat It video, you look at the Bad video, uh, you look at the way you make me feel, there's so much that, he, that, he, that inspired him for those pieces. And then there's obviously such a huge connection between Michael Jackson and MTV and really starting this real music video generation on MTV. I mean, Michael was really the king of that. So I like all of those connections. I and mean, obviously my connection with Michael and all of that coming together is kind of just one of those serendipitous things where all the elements have, have come together. So I'm excited for a lot of reasons to be a part of it. In general, with Michael, um, just had a wonderful relationship. I learned so much from him as an artist and as a kind human being. Um, and it's my goal to try and just continue uh, as much as I can in my own little world that legacy. Uh, I'm not sure about being a part of the tribute. I I've heard about it. And I'm excited about it either way, whether I'm involved in it or not. Um, it's as a, you know, because of Michael's connection to MTV, to all that he's done for the world of dance, uh, and pop music and pop dance. You know, there's no way that you couldn't pay tribute to that in the place in the place that it began. MTV. We talk so much about him as the pop legend, which is important, but it's nice to really remember that he was a man, that he was a father. And that's what it's really about, is the father and his children. And he's a wonderful dad. And, um, you know, at least they had the time with him that they did. So, so Susan uh, Constantine, uh, give me your thoughts on that video. 
Okay. Well, first of all, what I'd like to share with you, before you can analyze anyone, this is not about judging a person's character. It's about reading emotions. It's about right. reading through the lines, okay? So when we have to create what we call a baseline behavior, meaning that we, you know, when we were talking about doing this segment here, I said, you know, the first thing we have to do is I have to find other videos, things that I can use to compare and contrast with. Because I want to see him when he's feeling comfortable in his surroundings, where he's, there's no risk or reward, there's nothing that he's fearful of, uh, maybe dis you know, duping somebody, you know, just kind of him in the raw. So we found this right. video in 2009, the one you just heard. So we're using this as one of our videos for a baseline. So now I know there's a lot of uh, listeners in, so they may not see the video, but I want to sh share with you and help you to see this through my eyes. Um, I'm sure that you guys could hear the high energy in his voice. He was very expressive. You could also hear his voice inflection. There was lots of punctuation. He used rhythm um, and listened to his pace of his voice. And there was just a lot of movement. So now you could hear his voice. But if you could see the video, you would see his hands moving very rapidly. You know, I'm Italian, and I think you're Italian too, right? Okay. Right. So, and, yes. You know, right. when we okay. speak, we tend to, in, in our conversations, we just tend to use our hands. So you can yes. see he's very expressive yes. with his hands. He would show use very large shoulder shrugs as kind of emphasizing a certain point. He would raise his eyebrows, like a, what we call an eyebrow flash, and those are just kind of emphasizers. Like, I really want you to pay attention to this point. This is really important. Okay. So with that being said, now we're now moving forward. Okay, so now as we have a baseline behavior, we're looking for things that seem different, you know, as change in demeanor or where the facial expressions don't match their body language, their words don't match the voice inflection, you know, or any combination thereof. And then during that, when we're contrasting, I'm looking for what we call hot spots, things that don't fit. It's like saying, Hey, I'm really having a good time. But normally, right. in a norm situation, it's like, hey, I'm really having a great time. Okay? <laughs> so, well, we know what some of the norm is, but why is there a change? That should not be considered being deceptive. It rather means that's a hot spot. It's just, why is it? We just want to know why. So we need to dig deeper and probe around it and find out why there's a change. So now we're moving forward into 2013 um, audio. Right. So, okay, would you like to uh, play yes. that one for your listeners? Okay. Okay. This is Matt Lauer and uh, Wade Robson, uh, 2013 from last week. Let's but this look. morning we begin this half hour with a new claim from Wade Robson, Michael Jackson's former protege and longtime defender, a claim that the pop star molested him for years. We're going to talk to Wade in a moment exclusively, but first, his story. For years, dancer and famed choreographer Wade Robson spoke of his one-time friend and mentor, Michael Jackson, with only admiration. Just had a wonderful relationship. I learned so much from him as an artist and as a kind human being. In fact, in 2005, when Jackson was acquitted of the only molestation charge he ever faced in court, Robson was a star defense witness. He was an adult, he was intelligent, he was articulate, and he was adamant that nothing untoward had ever happened when he was with Michael Jackson. But now Robson is making a belated claim against Jackson's estate because his lawyer said Jackson was a sexual predator, and Robson last year collapsed under the stress and sexual trauma of what happened to him for seven years as a child. In my opinion, this is all about greed and money. But child abuse experts say that Wade's belated accusation is not uncommon and that sexually abused children often take decades to acknowledge abuse. Tragically, this is a very, very common story. Study after study after study on childhood sexual abuse has shown that it takes adulthood for many victims to come forward and that it is very possible that even kids in their 20s do not understand that a crime was committed against them. Jackson's estate says Robson's claims are outrageous and have no credibility. Good morning. Good, morning. Good to see you. you. You know that the things you're going to say here this morning and perhaps in a court of law are going to get a lot of attention, make a lot of headlines. So yeah. before I ask you specifics, what's your mindset right now? What's my mindset? Um, I feel strong. I feel 
like this is the right thing to do because this is my truth. Despite what some people may say after you say these things? Yes. Let me take you back to 2005, Wade, all right? The child molestation trial of Michael Jackson. You were the first witness called by the defense, and the attorney for Michael Jackson said he called you first because you were so convincing and powerful, asserting the innocence of Michael Jackson. Yeah. And here we are these years later, and you're going to say just the opposite. Right. What happened? First of all, one thing I want to clear up is that this is not a case of repressed memory. It's anyway, been reported in the yeah, press some. I never forgot one moment of what Michael did to me. But I was psychologically and emotionally completely unable and, and unwilling to understand that it was sexual abuse. So what are you alleging that he actually did? He sexually abused me from seven years old until 14. I know it's a, it's, a, it's a difficult and personal question, but can you be more specific? Because you're accusing someone who is deceased of criminal activity. Yeah. So I need you to be a little more specific. Did he perform sexual acts on you? Did he force you to perform sexual acts on him? What was the nature of the abuse? Yes, exactly what you said. He performed sexual acts on me and forced me to perform sexual acts on him. How old were you when it started? Seven. And how long did it last? Until about 14. Now, did when you testified in 2005, mm -hmm. and you took the stand and you raised your right hand, and you right. swore under oath that nothing sexual ever happened between you and Michael Jackson, yeah. why did you lie? You know, I said what I understood, and I said what I was able to say from seven years old from day one of the abuse Michael told me that we loved each other and that this was love that this was a, an expression of our love and then you'd follow that up with you know but if you ever tell anyone what we're doing both of our lives and our careers will be over um, when I was 11 when the first uh, trial was going on the criminal investigation in 93 mm -hmm. Um, he would call me every day in role play and, and, and tell me the same sort of things and also tell me then that if anyone ever thought that we did these things, any of these sexual things, that both of us would go to jail for the rest of our lives. When you testified in 2005, did, yeah. did Michael Jackson or anyone working for him offer you money to say the things you said? Did they tell you you must lie on the stand at that time? No. There was no money. There was no s you must lie. Michael, when when he would talk to me before these things were going on and he would call me every day as these things were happening it was complete manipulation and brainwashing it wasn't any sense of the truth on the phone he would role play with me and train me for these scenarios you know uh, you say it's not repressed memory you yeah. say you always knew and had in your mind what happened between you and michael jackson you also say that when you finally had a son of your own that it was looking at that son that made you think if anyone ever did to your son what Michael Jackson did to and with you, you'd kill that person. Yeah, during, uh, I'm a father, and I became a father two and a half years ago to this beautiful baby boy. And um, during the first 18 months of his life, I collapsed into two nervous breakdowns, terrifying nervous breakdowns. At that point, I had no idea what was wrong with me, what was going on. During the second one, this thing happened where I started looking at him and imagining him being a victim of the sexual abuse that I was at the hands of Michael. And for the first time in my life, I began to realize that my completely numb and unexplored feelings in relationship to what Michael did to me might be a problem, and maybe I needed to speak to someone about it. Howard Weitzman, who's a lawyer for the Jackson estate, said this in a statement. Mr. Robson has adamantly denied under oath and in numerous interviews over the past 20 years that Michael Jackson ever did anything inappropriate to him. Now he wants us to believe that he committed perjury at least twice and has been lying to anyone and everyone about Mr. Jackson since the early 1990s so he can file a claim for money. Mr. Robson's transparent lawsuit comes nearly four years after Michael passed. His claim is outrageous and sad. Jermaine Jackson, Michael's brother, said Wade Robson is full of and then used an expletive. Mm -hmm. What's your response? I understand completely how hard it is to understand this. Um, that being said, the idea that I would make all of this up and put myself, my wife, my son, my entire family through this you know, extremely stressful and painful experience 
all for the sake of money is completely But that's what you're going to be accused of. You're going to be accused. You're going to say you, you defended Michael Jackson while he was alive because he was good for your career. Mm-hmm. And now that he's gone, there's an opportunity here to sue his estate. He can't defend himself and get money. Right. Why didn't you go to the lawyers and do this quietly? And try to, to settle some, right. make some kind of a deal. Right, because I've lived in silence and denial for 22 years, and I can't spend another moment in that. In order to truly heal, I have to speak my truth, and I have to speak the whole truth. That's one thing that you'll never see from me. I'm never going to go away with this for the sake of money. I'm never going to be silenced for money. That's not going to happen. With, with all that you've been through, all your, the work you did with Michael Jackson and what you now allege was sexual abuse by Michael Jackson, when I say his name to you this morning, what do you think of? Heartbreak, pain, anger, and compassion. There's, um, you know, there's no excuse for what he did to me, and I believe many others, but, um, but he was a troubled man and every effect has its cause. You know, the image that one presents to the world um, is not the whole explanation of who someone is. You know, Michael Jackson was, yes, an incredibly talented artist and a, with an incredible gift. He was many things. And he was also a pedophile and a child sexual abuser. His fans have been contacting me on Twitter this morning in, in record numbers, Wade. Yeah. And a lot of them are saying you're a traitor. Mm-hmm. You understand their emotions this morning? I understand how confusing it is to understand, you know, how hard it is to understand. I get that. But um, all it takes is a little bit of education into child sexual abuse and realizing how unfortunately typical my scenario is. The trauma and the psychological effects of child sexual abuse last for so long. You know, I had no understanding of this until up to just over a year ago. And I'm just at the beginning of my healing process. I'm sure I'll be dealing with this for the rest of my life. But um, I'm so thankful that this is happening now because now I can get my life back. You know, and my son, my son is the one that saved my life. Wade Robson. Wade, thanks very much for your time this morning. Thanks I appreciate it. Okay, Susan, uh, <laughs> give me your analysis of this uh, very interesting uh, video. Yes. Now, remember in the first segment, we were just talking about the before, the one we used as our norm, right? We're trying to find our baseline. Now we move forward to the 2013. And remember when I talked about that, you know, we have to look for things that don't fit. You know, the facial right. expressions don't match the words. Body language right. doesn't match the, the words or the voice, etc. This is what I want you to be able to see things that, you're, that people may be missing, okay? So when right. I listened to the 2013, the first thing I did is I wanted to just to run it through, through its entirety, just kind of get my take on it just at first glance. Then I slowed it down. I was listening to the words that were spoken, and then I wanted to tie in what would be the appropriate emotion when he spoke that word. And what I found consistently throughout his, his statement in, in that interview, that there were contradictions between his words spoken and what his body language was saying, which actually betrayed the words that he spoke. And I'm going to share well. with you how. Okay. okay. The very beginning, we now know that was the first thing he opened up with, uh, you know, what's your mindset right now? He says, I feel strong. Okay. Right. Now, if you could visualize, I could take you into that interview. You're looking at Matt Lauer seated in the chair, and then, of course, we have Wade. Uh, we right. have Matt Lauer. He's got one leg crossed over the other. He's got his palms up. He's talking. He's in a very relaxed but a open posture. So right. now the words that were spoken by Wade, he says, I feel strong. Strong meaning that he feels confident, that he feels powerful. Now when his body language is kind of constricted, he has his hand kind of kind of perched in between his thighs, as if, you know, he's kind of poking it in. That's making your body language very small. It is the complete opposite of feeling strong. And oftentimes right. what we find 
that people that might hold their hands underneath the table or they might conceal them underneath, what else are they concealing? So right. that was my okay, that was my first thing. The other thing is what I look for, the moment he said that I feel strong, you would notice that one of his shoulders, you could see what we call a very micro shoulder shrug. It just means kind of like just one little shoulder just kind of pops up real quick. Not both shoulders, just one. That is what we call a micro shoulder shrug. And in Dr. Paul Ekman's work in detecting deception, what we find that people that are lying to us or might not be stretching the truth or could be somewhat deceptive, you will notice they tend to use these little micro shoulder shrugs. Now, the difference is when I shrug, like bring both my shoulders up, which will be consistent with I don't know, I'm not right. sure, you would see that. But when you right. say I feel strong and one shoulder shrugs, that now canceled out the words you just spoke, which was consistent with his body language that was retracting versus looking powerful and confident. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Absolutely, okay. yes. Uh, okay. So now that was the first thing. The other thing that I'm looking at is I'm also comparing his voice inflection. Now, I'm not going to uh, minimize what he's saying because, you know, quite frankly, I wasn't there, they were there, I don't know. I don't know with 110% absolute that something, I don't know, could have occurred. But what I can tell you is the stories aren't fitting and somebody really? is not telling the truth, okay? And since Michael Jackson is not here to tell the story, I would assume that one feels empowered to be able to do this on their own and not having to have the rebuttal from the person who really was supposed to be the willing participant here. Okay? Right. So, okay. So the other thing is what we notice, too, with his body language, is that he doesn't meet what we call the belly button rule. It's like when, when you're speaking to someone, when you're interested in talking to them, when you feel safe with them, you actually will angle your body exactly towards, like almost pointing your belly button in the other direction. By the way, we call that naval intelligence, by the way. <laughs> no, okay. You're supposed to laugh at this one, okay? <laughs> All mm -hmm. right. So anyway, you would, you would actually align your body. But when you are trying to escape or when you're trying to avert, your body language will shift away from the person that's interviewing you and generally towards an exit, like a way out, an escape route. And so this is what he did when he was speaking to Matt Lauer. You notice that his body language was shifted away. He, has, he was not crossing his legs or mirroring the other person, which is showing tremendous, would show rapport. They're not doing that. You can see that he was not in rapport with Matt Lauer and he wanted to escape out. This is right. important because what we find is, you know, I've been doing this for a very long time, and especially analyzing a lot of these high-profile trials. And what I find consistent with is that people, when they feel um, under uncomfortable and they feel like they're, if they're going to lie to you, most of them just don't just meet you head on like a bulldog. They will avert. <clears throat> they will shift their shoulders. They will shift their body language or their hips to away from the other person. It's just a natural thing that they do. Um, the other thing is that I noticed was in the voice inflection. Did you hear the difference in the tone? The first one, there was lots of energy. Of course, he was in an environment where there's lots of things going on. And then his tone now changed in this one. But of course, this is something that's very serious now. So we have to consider, is that, would that be the normal tone when you're talking about something so private? You would assume yes. But then again, right. keep in mind, he's on national television telling everybody right. the entire world this, then he's supposed to feel strong. He should be very strong in his voice and his inflection. And that contradicted, it, contradicted one another. Um, so what we're listening to is when you're talking about the sexual molestation, I'm going to give you an example. Um, when you're talking about being sexually molested, now you're so angry you know, that you could have killed him because now, you know, this right. is a, you know, I'm thinking, I'm looking at my son, I'm thinking if anybody could have done anything to him, what happened to me, I was going to kill him. What would the natural reaction on their face look like when they're saying that word? You would see little leakages of anger, of frustration, of hatred, right. disgust, nothing, right. flat, completely flat. It reminds me of when I was analyzing Tiger Woods. When he got oh. into all this 
Skidol. Okay. That. Okay. So when he said when he was being interviewed and he said I didn't have anything to do with this, you know, I didn't hurt her, etc. Um, you would, and then he says that he, he was apologizing. So when he was saying he was sorry, you didn't see the muscles in his forehead that are consistent with sadness. But when I saw sadness is when he was talking about how he disappointed all of the people that he was at work for him, all of his sponsors. So I saw where his alignment was. So when I'm reading body language, I'm looking at what is the appropriate emotion when you're using very strong words like that, a monster or or you want to kill them, you should see that emotion. And also, too, here's the other thing. It should make you, uh, the person who is listening and watching, to feel that same emotion if it were authentic. If he were delivering it in authenticity and it truly happened, it will move you to feel anger or disgust or sadness, whatever that emotion is, and you didn't do that. Um, we heard him talk about the heartbreak and the pain and the compassion. Right. That's how he felt about Michael Jackson. When heartbreak. someone's talking about heartbreak, we're going to see sadness. Sadness where the, the corners of the mouth might turn down slightly. You will see the corners of their eye rolls turn up, and it causes wrinkling across the forehead of stress and pain. That's consistent with those words, heartache and pain. It wasn't there. The last one was compassion. You know, when you're feeling compassion, you would generally put your hand towards your heart or maybe towards your tummy area because that's something that's heartfelt or put your palm towards your body somewhere, okay? Usually mm -hmm. your chest area. That wasn't there. So that leads me to see, and to, when, I, when I'm hearing this, something's off. These are those hot spots I was talking about. There were so many inconsistencies based on his normal behavior, and the words just didn't match up to what his body language was saying. So I can say, with my, in my heart, I can tell you that I feel that he was not being truthful. And um, he said, "This quote, this is my truth." This what is did you my get truth. Into that? Well, he right. says, owner, that's my truth. That's not your truth and what really truly happened. It's my truth. Here's the thing, too, what's interesting. People that lie and don't tell the truth, it's, it's, they could tell you a complete fabricated lie. But if right. they believe that to be truthful to them, who are we to say that they're not telling the truth if they live in self-deception? Exactly. So, I, if you can grasp that for a minute, because that's where we get people that are highly narcissistic, they're sociopaths, psycho, really sickos, psychopaths, they live in their own reality. But, you know, when you're, when you're listening to that, when you're saying, that's my truth, but then he follows it with a whole truth. But see, it was the order in which he said that. It was right. my truth and the whole truth. He should have said it was the truth. He, ha he didn't have to embellish it. He didn't have to add the additional language in there. He didn't have to use the additional contracture. So we learn a lot about words that people say and the order in which they say them, how they phrase them, that also is very significant. What about I feel sympathy for him and then I feel uh, he was a genius? You know, you're talking about somebody that allegedly for seven to 14 years, as he said it. Yeah, well, let's get into that. Seven to 14 yeah. years. What did you think of uh, his uh, statements about seven to 14? Well, you know, here's the thing is I find, and of course he's not a convicted felon or anything like that. You know, he's just making a statement that he believes is true. Um, they Absolutely. have a lot of time to think about stuff. You know, think about it here. How many years he's now since Michael's been passed that he's been able to think about what he's going to say. And to me, with his, it happened between 7 and 14, was like saying that uh, it happened anywhere between this time and that time. It was very scripted to me. It rolled off his tongue too quickly. I would assume that he might have said, well, it happened around when I was in around 7, and it continued on until you know, I was a teen, somewhere around 14. You would assume because right. they're now taking you through that journey, not 7 to 14. It's, you know, it's just like he had it so constructed. It was so contrived when he said that. Right. Um, and, and then the other thing, go ahead. 
Go ahead. Yeah, I was going to say, the first thing he says out of the gate, um, which, of course, TMZ got a hold of some transcripts, allegedly, and they said it was repressed memory. Right out of the gate, he says, I want to tell everybody that this is not a case of repressed memory. What were right. your thoughts when you heard that? Okay. You know what this kind of reminds me of? I, you know, I, I just can't help but, you know, <laughs> analyze different cases and stuff that I've been involved in. And, you know, right, right out of the gate he says that because that's the first and foremost thing that he, that he wants everybody to know. You know, it's interesting in the order people use their words. You know, out of the gate he says, uh, you know, not a case of repressed memory. Well, mm -hmm. I would assume, I bet you if you can go into the courts and you can look at all the motions and the actual lawsuit that's filed, I am sure that this has something to do with um, his case. So, you know, this is something that he's going to have to prove in his case. I did not have repressed memory. I just want to make that clear to you. And, you know, when I listen to like, uh, and of course this is completely different, but I'm talking about people that um, sometimes don't tell the truth, which we've seen this with the case, uh, Jody Arias, is they are um, sometimes, you know, they have this fog. Uh, they, it's not repressed in memory. Certain things I can right. remember, but other things I can't remember. And, and it's amazing how other things I can remember so vividly and other things I can't hardly remember it all. I just don't remember it all. And so and she, she even said in her own case that, um, you know, I, when I was lying before, as if she's not lying now, is that I would match the evidence with what my statements were. Think about that. So when, right. I'm, when I'm listening to this, I'm going, you know, let's just go through the court's files and let me just see what it is he's, what's filed. Because I bet you anything, somewhere in there, he's going to be talking about this repressed memory. That's right. not a case of repressed memory. Wow, wow, some powerful stuff. Now, um, the, I want to give you uh, a question about the, question, the uh, interviewer, Matt Lauer. Uh, it seemed to me, and a lot of people are posting, that he was, quote, uh, leading him, if you will, um, the questions were kind of like leading him to a certain path, if you will. Mm -hmm. did, what did you see out of Matt Lauer? Well, Matt Lauer wants to get down to the facts, but you know he's a journalist too. So he's like any other yeah. journalist that they're going to laser focus and crystallize, you know, what really happened. But what he was trying to do is to get away from this ambiguous language. You know, he, sometimes he was a little vague. He didn't go into, he just said, he, you know, yes, that's what he did to me. Um, and he says, well, we just want to make this clear, what really happened. I mean, let's be clearer about it. That's what he's wanting to do. So in the sense of even if it were me outside of, I would have done the same thing. I would have asked him very clear, you have made these accusations. He used very tough, tough uh, voice inflection because, you know, now you're coming out and you're telling everybody this. And so there was a sense of uh, anger in his voice, um, which could have made, you know, uh, the other, uh, well, he could have shrilled because of it, but he didn't. You know, he, he still kind of stayed in his own little body language and, you know, uh, but he didn't fire it back. I would like to have seen if he said that he was strong, fire it right back at him. You're wrong. All right. That's not, you know, when a person is falsely accused of something, what it would be the natural reaction? When, if they're falsely accused? If somebody, if I falsely accused you of doing something very heinous, what would be your natural reaction? I would be very, very angry and, and I'd want to, right, yes. Exactly. So that angry. would be the appropriate response is that you would have some frustration in your voice. So when Matt's coming at him, why didn't he volley the ball back? Uh, maybe it's not uh -huh. part of his personality. Um, but, you know, that's something that I would want to look further into. I'd want to question that. But, you, you know, he's, he's a journalist. That's his job. And you know what? He knew that before he came in. He wanted the interview. He's the one that wanted to tell the entire world. So then he, was, uh, he had to be up for the game. And uh, he asked him, well, he said sort of, I'm not here for men, uh, money, but yet there's a creditor's claim. He's on national television. Uh, on one of the biggest shows, you know, in the world, in America at least. So what did that tell you? I'm not here for money, he says. 
Okay, when he says that I'm not in there for money, we ever heard people say, you know, to tell you the truth, or to be perfectly honest with you, okay, well, why weren't you honest with me before? So his words in itself, he just told you what he was going for. He just told you right there. I'm not in for the money. Why did you bring it up? You know, you have to look at, you have to look at why, why does someone just bring that up out of the blue? Why do they, why is it even in the conversation it, if it has nothing to do with money? And then you have to think about, well, you know, what's the motive? Uh, why is it he couldn't just keep this to himself? Why is it so important for him to tell everybody, to make it a national make it national news. You have to wonder why, for self-healing, for whatever. You could have done that in a counselor's office, for goodness sake, filed a right. lawsuit, never gone in front of the camera, but he didn't do that. He chose another path, and those are the things I have to question why. Wow. Wow, interesting. Now, um, before we let go of this, we're going to get into Jerry and Sandusky in a little bit, but uh, so uh, do you think... Uh, he'll come away with anything uh, with this uh, case, with all these inconsistencies, the video, uh, everything you pointed out. If you were a judge, what would you do with this case? Well, first of all, I am a teen court judge. <laughs> that does help a little bit. <laughs> um, right. I'm a volunteer teen court judge, I should say. But, you know, it's not the judge who makes, up the, that, makes that decision. That's the jury. It begins up being a jury trial. So, um, you know, it would be in the hands of a six or – it wouldn't be – it's not a capital case. There would probably be six jurors and uh, with a couple alternates, and they would have to decide on that case. But, you know, what's going to happen is, is that all those videos are going to be played. You're going to have right. people that specialize, that are expert witnesses as it deals with repressed memory of uh, those that have gone – that are now uh, suppressed their emotions for many years, and now they're letting it out. And they'll probably have some very compelling expert witnesses. So I would say if I were on the defense, I would get ready with my expert witnesses to rebuttal all the inconsistencies and uh, the very powerful statements that were made early on. And also, you know, that he wasn't a young kid when he did it in 2009 when he spoke. So I think that's going to be quite interesting. I'll certainly we'll be keeping in touch and we'll be more than likely in the courtroom to watch that one. Right. And we spoke yesterday uh, and, you know, I first contacted you about Michael Jackson and you wrote a little passage uh, or chapter in the book uh, mm -hmm. uh, that, that may be released soon. Uh, can you tell us about that a little bit? Sure. It's a book. It's a, it really interesting because um, when you called me about this, it was I, I was writing a book. It was um, I think right. it was because it's not actually in the process because I stopped writing the book because I ended up getting another book deal and had to have it done within a certain period of time. So I dropped it temporarily to pick it back up again. But it's called "See What You've You've Been Missing in Trial Celebrities and Politicians." And uh, there's a chapter in there that's called Sex, Lies, and Split Verdicts, which is analyzing the differences between a true sexual predator, profile, uh, predator Jerry Sandusky, and Michael Jackson, who I believe is, was completely innocent. So what we're looking at are the, the parallels between the two of them of having, you know, these organizations for children. We had the Second Mile Club, and then we had the Neverland uh, Ranch and so forth. But what I share in this chapter is how similar they are, but completely opposing in every sense of the word. Because right. the difference is, is that Jerry Sandusky developed the Second Mile Club for his own sexual pleasure. He wanted to keep them captive in his own group so that he could, he could abuse them. And when you look at his body language and all the videos, and I went through numerous videos, and there was so much deception. Uh, he is truly a sexual predator. And when I looked at Michael Jackson, I'm seeing a young, even though he's in his 40s, that when he was developed, it was really about fulfilling a part of his life he never had. The silliness, the giddiness, right. the, um, the childlike type of play that he would, I mean, you know, watching movies and popcorns and hanging all out in the bedroom. To him, it was like he became a... Uh, a child 
when he became an adult, and he was an adult when he was a child, which is the complete opposite. And when you looked at the right. two of them, to me, it was so glaring. Uh, I was I was so compelled. I've got to write this book. I've got to write this book. The word's got to get out. Right, right, right. Mm-hmm. A lot of people uh, that weren't educated said when they first heard the allegations of Van Dunsky said, "Oh boy, this is another Michael Jackson." And you're saying, of course, this is nothing of Michael. This is night and day, if you will, right? It's truly night and day, you know, and I can't even tell you that they're opposite ends of the world. There is no similarities other than the fact that, that there are children that were involved. Um, they both were male. Um, they both loved children, but one loved them in a sexual way and the other one loved them in a friendship way and was fulfilling a part of him that he never had. So, you know, they're just totally different. When when you see the videos of Jerry Sandusky, well, talk about this. Yeah. I'm going to play. The, a, oh, I'm okay. going to play this video, and right. uh, on the other side, you'll 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 tell our listeners uh, what you take out okay. of it. Okay. Okay. These allegations are false. I didn't do those things. I don't know what else to say. Last month, former Penn State assistant football coach Jerry Sandusky was arrested on charges of sexual abuse of children. Since then, other questions have emerged. What did officials around him know, and what did they do? This is Joe Becker of the New York Times. I sat down with Sandusky several times this week at the home of his lawyer, Joseph Amendola. We spoke not only about the allegations and the university, but also about Second Mile, the charity he founded, and his feelings toward the children that it served. Portions of my interview were captured on camera, but others only in audio. Yeah, I, I talked to Mr. Sandusky about some of his activities with children of Second Mile. I think that some people think taking a kid, overnight trips to a game, being in a shower with a kid that isn't your own, that has been alarming to some people, those facts. And I think, if what, I, think what I heard you say is you didn't see it as like somebody else's kid. You saw it more like... These kids are part of my my family. Is that? And they, you know, so many of them would say that. But is that? You know, it, yeah. I mean, so to... I mean, it was a mutual feeling, you know, a family like feeling. It was, you know, it was an extended family. We were an extended family, an extended father. But is that why you didn't have the kind of bar- barriers or red flags up that somebody else might, you know, say, I don't want to be alone in a room with a kid. I mean... Yeah. In a grand jury report released last month, Sandusky was charged with 40 counts of sexually abusing young boys. In 1998, an investigation was launched by university police and the State Child Protection Agency. A mother claimed Sandusky had hugged her 11-year-old son while showering with him in a Penn State locker room. I asked Sandusky about the extent of that investigation. I I was talked to once. You know, by an officer? By the two, by one person from Children and Youth and by... And an officer. And that was it? Uh, yeah. And as far as you know... And back right after that, then we got an unfounded report. Uh, that was within a couple of days, I think. Law enforcement officials closed the investigation and it appears no further action was taken by the university. Sandusky said the university president never confronted him Neither did his boss, Joe Paterno, Penn State's legendary head coach. How could Coach Paterno and Graham Spanier not know that one of the star coaches on the football team you know, at least was being investigated? I don't know that he didn't know. Mm-hmm. I know that he didn't never said anything to me. I know that. In 2002, there was another incident in the locker room showers. An assistant football coach, Mike McQuery, has testified to the grand jury that he witnessed Mr. Sandusky sodomizing a young boy and that he reported some version of that scene to Mr. Paterno the following day. Paterno has testified that he then informed the university's athletic director, Tim Curley, that Sandusky had done something sexually inappropriate with a young boy. Curley, who has been charged with lying to the grand jury, testified that he was told that Sandusky was inappropriately, quote, horsing around, unquote, with a boy in the shower. Curly met Sandusky to discuss the incident. Here's what Sandusky said. Yeah, he was concerned. I mean, you know, he was concerned about it, yeah. 
Did he um, talk about horseplay? How did he couch it when he raised it with you? In other words, he he must have said he didn't. You're saying he certainly didn't say what's being said today. So what what did he say? Just that some somebody was uncomfortable and. Well, he was coming to me with a concern. Mm -hmm. uh, he was coming to me with a concern because, you know, and I guess in his words, somebody had talked to him about um, inappropriate behavior in the shower. Mm -hmm. okay. so, so. And you told him we were, this is... Yeah, I I told him that I, you know, it didn't happen, and uh, you know there wasn't, in my mind, there wasn't inappropriate behavior, and I said, if you if you want, you could speak to the the, the person, the young person that was involved. I asked what restrictions Curley put on Sandusky, who by then was retired yet still had access to the university's facilities. Right, I wasn't, he didn't want me to bring kids in there and work them out anymore. And I, I remember saying, well, could I just work them out? And he said, no. Yeah. And then, what, did he, like, take your keys? Or you, you were no, able to keep going there? No, right? he didn't take my keys. I still have my keys. Okay. And I still went in there and worked out. Prosecutors say all the alleged victims passed through Sandusky's second mile program. Talk to me, if you will, about sort of how, you know, sort of how you kind of physically interacted with kids and, and how sort of to understand that within the context of the second mile. Because I think some of the things, if you don't have any context, might seem to some people showering with kids, blowing on their stomach, bear hugging them, might to some people in a vacuum seem strange. I I don't I wasn't playing. I mean that was just me. I I don't know, you know. Like I said, I I I grew up at a recreation center. There was constant activity. I worked on a playground. I loved active kids. Press further about his physical interaction with second mile children. He had this to say: the environment was 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 family like. I mean, and and and, and I guess you know, in, in times that that you had with them, you always, those, all the times were precious times. You know, they, they were, they were significant times because they weren't, they, you know, they, they weren't going to have you and you weren't going to have them, you know, so it was, it was all kind of, it was significant times, it was important times and, um, so I mean, I guess it's just, Happened that way. I don't know. Ooh. Ooh, that's kind of... Sandusky maintains his innocence and remains out on bail while state prosecutors build their case. He has only spoken out one other time since his arrest in a phone interview with Bob Costas on NBC. Are you sexually attracted to young boys, to underage boys? Am I sexually attracted to yes. underage boys? Sexually attracted? You know, no, I, I enjoy young people. I'm sitting there saying, well, what in the world is this question? You know, what, what, what is, you know, am I going to be, if I say, no, I'm not attracted to boys, that's not the truth because I'm attracted to young people, boys, girls. Yeah, but not uh, sexually. You're attracted because you enjoy spending time. Right, I enjoy, I, that's what I was trying to say. I en I enjoy spending time with young people. I enjoy spending time with people. I mean, my two favorite groups are the elderly and the young. The young because they they don't think about what they say, and the old because they don't care. You know, so those I love being around both groups, both those groups of people because, and neither one of them are going anywhere. They're not caught up like all of us in trying to make a living and trying to to impress people they they are who they are and and that's why i love those groups those, those are my two favorite groups of people oh, oh you're going to like that <laughs> no right i can't listen to him anymore uh, susan constantine uh
seriously, though, give me your take on that clip before we let oh, you goodness. get out of here. Yeah, there's so many things. Um, the first thing is start out with a little ha-ha, you know. Most people will open up or end with a deceptive statement with a laugh or a giggle or a smile. So look out for that. There's always that little ha-ha afterwards. And uh, the, there, there was so much stuff in there, you know, when he was talking about, you know, even the little ones, the ones he loved are the little boy or young children and older people. Well, they're very vulnerable when it's what they tend to prey on. And when you watch his body, his lawyer, his his lawyer, lawyer when he's company. off to the side, is, well, yeah, because he was asking the question, are you attracted to little boys or, uh, and he's sexually attracted. He goes, sexually attracted? Sexually attracted. It's what we call repeated assertion. You know, he's got to repeat it twice. He's buying time because he didn't know actually how to say it. It's what happens when you're about ready to tell a lie. The cognitive load builds, and it's a, and you're wanting to say one thing. Your brain is saying another thing, and there's this collide between the two of them. And so that's where that pause, that hesitation, that nervousness comes out. He couldn't answer the question right. He should have said, of course not, or no. But his attorney on the side has got to remind him, and he says, no, I'm attracted to little boys, I'm attracted to little girls, and, you know, it goes on and, and later on talks about horsing around in the shower. It's not, and to him, it was not appropriate. And sexual predators think that their victims are attracted to them. I know this is sick. They think that they have a connection. They're like family, like he said. They don't think what they're doing is wrong or in, inappropriate. So for him, it was like this other one. It was his truth. No, absolutely, and... Uh... The blinking in that video, I, I, we obviously just played the audio. What does that tell you if somebody's blinking like that? Rapid eye blinking is anxiety. You know, when we saw President Clinton, when he said, I did not have sex with that woman, Monica Lewinsky, he had a rapid eye blinking. I don't know if it was like 30 or 40 uh, blinks per minute. But when he was speaking, you know, when he's in his norm about subjects that he feels comfortable with, his blinking is about 15 or 20, so it was double or triple more than it would be when he was in an environment that he felt safe. So any speech errors, pauses, hesitations, giggles, shoulder shrugs, uh, lots of speech errors, you know, grasping, and the words don't match up. There's a lot of mistakes in their language. They, they say things in it, then they retract them. They're vague, or they give you embellished information that's just way too much. You know, there's all kinds of little things that uh, in this training class, if you're interested in it, uh, will break through a yeah. lot of these um, areas of what we're talking about on detecting deception. Yes, and uh, uh, before we let you go, uh, as an expert opinion, uh, the Michael Jackson community on everybody, your extra opinion on what Matt Lauer and the alleged things that happened. Can you give it to us? Based on his baseline behavior and what I witnessed in the contradictions in the body language versus the words spoken, which I think the body language betrayed him, that I'm telling you that my personal and professional opinion is that he's not telling the truth. Okay, and that Michael Jackson did not sexually molest him. Good night, right. everyone. Good night. And your website is? It's SusanConstantine.com. Susan, we'll have you on again. Thank you a million. You're welcome. Bye-bye.